I, I would tell you that um, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. And uh, I, I didn't hear the gospel until I was a sophomore in college. I grew up in State College, Pennsylvania, which is the town where Penn State is, went to school at Penn State, and uh, heard the gospel the first time there. And as a result of hearing the gospel at Penn State, I uh, was engaged uh, heavily in Campus Crusade for Christ. And that's where I began to really hear about a vision for the world. It began way back then. I remember I was, I was walking from my fraternity house onto campus, and there was a, a gal I'd gotten to know um, who she was really mature in the Lord, and I was brand new. And we sort of uh, intersected uh, right at a, uh, an intersection, and she said, wow, Bob, isn't it so cool? The Christian life is just supernatural. Well, that, I remember, I'll never, for, I'll never forget how that impacted me for her to remind me that the Christian life is supernatural. And then as I got to know her, I, I learned that she had a real burden for China. And so for the past 30 years, whenever somebody mentions China or I see China in the news, I, I think of this girl that I just got to know as a brand new Christian and her saying those two things, Bob, isn't it cool? The Christian life is supernatural. And then hearing her heart for China. That was actually the first moment I can remember of being globally conscious, globally aware of something other than watching the news or hearing what's happening in Greece or uh, what's going on in Iran, but really beginning to think globally about how the gospel needs to go to the nations. Uh, I've had, since that time, uh, multiple opportunities, I'll talk more about this, to go overseas. I want to tell you about a particular day I was in Moscow. Uh, this was about, uh, well, no, it was 10 years ago, it was 2005. And uh, it was amazing how inexpensive things can be in Moscow. So we're in a hotel, and it's certainly not a five-star hotel by any stretch of the imagination, but the location is amazing. It is directly across the street from the Kremlin. I mean, we are overlooking Red Square, and this is like $69 a month, uh, a night. I mean, just crazy, uh, inexpensive. So we're, we're looking out over Red Square. We're looking out over the Kremlin. We're having meetings uh, with some folks trying to plant a church in Moscow. And uh, I'll, over a couple of days, I just become run down from the jet lag, I guess, and, and from going pretty hard while we were there. And I, I came down with the flu. And uh, I was able somehow uh, to find out where a, a pharmacy was uh, across Red Square. And the rest of the team um, was going uh, to do one, another one of our meetings. And I was left by myself. Uh, I had had a little bit, it had been probably my 13th or 14th time to be in Russia. So I had some, some Russian down. I could get by passively. So I, I, was, I was by myself and I realized I needed to cross Red Square, go through all these hundreds of gypsies. These, these are people that, in many ways, they're trafficked. Um, they have owners. They're not sexually trafficked necessarily, but they're trafficked in human slavery. Uh, they need to uh, bring in a certain amount of money through begging. They have little kids uh, begging for money and they've got to produce a certain amount of money to whoever their handler is. And it's a very dangerous uh, situation when you're alone because uh, I'm, almost every time I've been in Russia, uh, there's been an attempted mugging. Uh, we have uh, had to even fight off people on the metro. It's just crazy over there, and I think it's, it's, it's getting crazier with some of the things that, that Putin is putting into place. So I, I'm feeling a little uneasy about needing to go to this pharmacy by myself, um, in Moscow, there are not nearly as many people, at least 2005, speaking English as you would think. And so I said, Lord, I, I'm feeling uneasy. I don't know what to do, but I've got to get to the pharmacy. I've got to get this medicine. And uh, my, one of my practices has been, normally I read through the Bible in a year, and so it's, it's dated. And I, I've kept journals ever since my conversion at Penn State. So I have over 30 years of journals, hardback volumes. I should have brought one to show you. But in, in 2005, I happened to be doing the, the Psalms and Proverbs of the day kind of thing. So today's the 20th, you'd read Psalm 20, you'd read, you know, then add 30, Psalm 50, and so on, and read the Proverb 20. So it was May 21st, 2005. So I said, Lord, I just need some, some encouragement, some affirmation, or some wisdom. Maybe I shouldn't go. Maybe I should wait till the team gets back. 
So I'm reading Psalm 21, and uh, in verses 11 and 12, it says this, Though they plan evil against you, though they devise mischief, they will not succeed, for you will put them to flight. You will aim at their faces with your bows. Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. We will sing and praise your power. Well, that, that passage really spoke to me. I, I trusted that God's providence had me in Moscow on May 21st, and I was reading Psalm 21, and that I was specifically praying for wisdom and for God to move and to guide me, and I felt I had the answer. So I, I went ahead and got dressed, and I, you know, I've got like a fever of 103 or something like that, so I'm just miserable. Uh, thankfully, it was May and not January in Moscow. And I get to the pharmacy, get the medication, I'm walking back, and all of a sudden at my feet, <laughs> there is a wad of money. Dollars, rubles, and I don't know where it came from. And and I see a guy ahead of me in a backpack, and I think it may be his. So I reach down to pick it up, and, and I'm about ready to say something, and a Russian comes up to me in very broken English. says, no, 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 no. No, look, you find we keep. Uh, you take some, I take some, we get money. And uh, I said, oh, no, 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 uh, we, we, we can't do that. And he says, no, no, sure, yes, you take some, I take some. And then the guy that I thought whose money it was, it was his, he turned around and coming toward us and he started yelling, hey, hey, like I pickpocketed him. So now <clears throat> I'm in a pickle because I'm holding money that is definitely this man's. I don't know what this guy's going to say. Uh, I know this guy's going to accuse me. And, uh, and, and then this guy gets to me. And he sees me with the money. And he says, there's police over there. I'm going to call the police. You, you give me my money and you give me some of your money. Or I, or I will tell the police. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness. You know? And he's arguing with me. It's you know, people around us. It's a very crowded place off, off of Red Square. And uh, finally, I, I didn't know what else to do. So I, I just looked deep within his soul. I just looked deep within his eyes. And I just said, Pajalasta, Pajalasta. Pajalasta means please. And I just said, Pajalasta. And, and he looked back at me, <coughs> and everything on his face changed. And he said, it's okay, you go. And uh, I got back to the, the hotel, and the team was there, and we had some Russian translators. And they said, oh my goodness, that is the new thing in Moscow. And people don't escape it. It is a scam. And they said, were there police nearby? I said, yeah, they're all right. They said, the police are in on it because they're, they're, there's just so little income for so many people. Um, and it's a setup to, to either threaten you with jail um, and to get money from you in addition uh, to the money that they get back. And the two guys were actually working together. The guy who said, no, 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 you keep, we split. They're, they were working together. And it's a scam against Americans. And uh, the, the Russians were just amazed that I was either not hauled off to jail um, or they, you know, more likely because they knew I wouldn't go to jail. Uh, I would give them my money so I'd be out, you know, several hundred dollars. <coughs> but after it was all said and done, the Lord just sort of settled in on me and said, now, now what, what did you read? right before you left. I said, yeah, Lord, I've been meaning to talk to you about that. You said everything was going to be fine. And not, not that I believe in those kinds of words and things like that, but I did have a sense the Lord was leading me. And uh, he said, well, why don't you read the text again? So I pulled out Psalm 21. Though they plan evil against you, though they devise mischief, they will not succeed. For you will put them to flight. You will aim at their faith faces with your bows be exalted O lord in your strength and when that whole thing switched i had looked into that guy's face i had looked <clears throat> deep into his soul and said Pajalasta. and I, I am firmly convinced at that point god changed his heart and uh, enabled him to just turn away and let me go why do i share that uh, if, if you want to impact the local church for missions. And I believe the local church is the hope for missions. I believe the local church is uh, the foundation of missions. I believe the local church is actually the sending agency of missions. 
If you want to impact the local church in missions, you need to have a heart for global evangelization. Matter of fact, I would go far as to say if, if you're planning on being a pastor, whether it's a small church, large church, solo pastor, um, whatever, that uh, the, the world vision of the church will never rise higher than the world vision of the pastor. I'll just tell you that right now. The world vision of the church, your local congregation, will never rise higher than the world vision of the pastor. Uh, so if you're going to be in another kind of ministry in the local church, uh, maybe you'll need to champion global <coughs> vision to the pastor. But uh, that, that's a principle I really want you to be aware of. And so one of the best ways of gaining a vision is to go. Um, we, we had a church plant in 1989 is when we started the church. And right from the get-go, we had money budgeted for me to go on trips. Uh, and every single time I come back, the, the people of Oak Mountain say, Bob, um, every time you go back, you come back refreshed and you come back changed. And again, how can you experience what I experienced that May 21st, 2005? How can you experience that and not be changed? I mean, you will be challenged on the mission field unlike any other time, but you will see God show up on the mission field, unlike any other time. So if, if you want to experience uh, the work of God in a fresh way, put yourself on the mission field. But the other thing it does is it, it, it reminds you, it, it, it keeps you focused on true nerve of, of why we're here. Listen, why does the local church exist? Uh, Jesus is pretty clear. Okay, no, the Great Commission. Go into all the world and make disciples. Matthew 20, 18 to 20. Um, Paul, I think, is also a great um, uh, model for both pastoring and missions. And one of the passages that I try to pray through is, Matt, is uh, Romans 15, 17, 21. Let me read that for you. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. Now listen to this, verse 20, Romans 15, verse 20. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. Romans 15, 20, Paul's vision for his life was to take the gospel to places where it had not been preached. There's a man who had a global vision. Sounds like a missionary. Well, he was, but guess what? He was also a pastor of local churches. How can, how can this be described as anybody less than a man who has an incredible shepherd's heart? pastor of the flock. Acts chapter 20 verses 28 to 38. Paul's at Ephesus. Paul spent more time at Ephesus than any other church. Uh, he put his, his beloved protege, uh, Timothy, in charge after he left. So Timothy was the pastor of, the, <coughs> of Ephesus. And uh, Paul writes, or Luke writes in, in Acts 20, 28 to 38, quoting Paul. Again, Luke and Paul were traveling companions on mission trips. That's another principle, by the way. When you go on mission trips, never go alone. Never go alone. Take people with you. Paul took Luke. Um, that trip I was on, uh, I took one of my elders to Moscow. And he was there, and he heard the story, and he was experienced it. And, and he came back. He'll never be the same. So, so never go on mission trips alone. Um, so Paul says to these elders, he's on the beach about ready to leave them. He'll never see them again. And he says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. 
And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. And then he goes on, they prayed together. And it says, and there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. So, so here's this missionary that had a pastor's heart. They're, they're, they're not contradictory. They're complementary. Uh, I can remember talking to um, Chuck Swindoll and, and uh, one of my heroes of the faith, uh, a professor at Dallas Seminary named Howard Hendricks. And I was really wrestling because I love discipleship and I love missions. Should I just become a discipleship pastor? You know, I was about three years into planting Oak Mountain. And uh, it's like, I don't know. I mean, is it really worth it? Uh, could I get a lot more accomplished just by being focused? I never forget those two men were so kind. They didn't know me from, from Adam's house cat. And, and they heard my story and they said, Bob, under no circumstances should you leave the ministry you're in. Because over time, uh, God will use the local pastor to uh, change a church, to build a church, to change the world. And those two men gave me a, a vision for the local church and the role of the pastor um, and the staff in a local church. Um, so what I want to share in my uh, brief moments left together, three things. How do you seek grace from God to grow a, a missions vision in your own heart? Because again, uh, the mission vision of the church will never grow any higher than the mission vision of the pastor. Uh, how do you lead your church to grow a, a vision for missions? And then how do you preach? And Dave already talked about this. Um, how do you preach so that world missions becomes uh, a passion in the church? So first of all, how do you seek grace from God to grow a missions vision? Well, first of all, pray. Pray for missions. Uh, pray for a missions burden. Uh, pray through scripture. Uh, hopefully, and this is this is an aside. It's not even related to really a pastor leading a missions vision. Um, after after three decades of being in the ministry, can I preach for just a second? Don't you ever confuse sermon prep and teaching prep with your devotions. Don't you ever confuse those. They could not be more distinct. Okay? You're not reading scripture to try to figure out how you can pass it on to somebody else. In your devotions, you're reading scripture to meet with God and to hear his expression of love over you, to hear him whisper um, his delight over you in Christ and for him to challenge you to go deeper with him, to lead you to repentance, to lead you to a fresh draft of, of Christ and the gospel and to propel you out into your mission. So don't ever confuse your devotions and your prep time. Make sure you're spending time with the Lord devotionally. And in that devotional time, ask God for an awareness of his heart for missions. I mean, Missions is not man's idea, right? <clears throat> missions is God's idea. Missions, reaching the nations with the gospel is God's heartbeat. He, he has a people whom he loves. And he wants them to be redeemed. And the means of redemption is the gospel being preached uh, through the agency of his people, through the agency of his church. And so when I'm reading Romans 15, and I come to where Paul says that his ambition, his goal, his, his aim is to, is to go where Christ has not been preached. Okay, I've got to stop there if I'm having a devotional time. I've got to stop there and I can say, wait a minute, Lord, that's not my heart. See, because grace is true, the one person you can be most real with is your Father in heaven. You, no, no appearances, no airs. There's nothing you can do that would cause God to love you less than he loves you. And, and there's nothing you do to cause God to make him love you any more than he already does. 
So you can be absolutely real with God. And, and here's what I say. God, I'm not even close to having Paul's vision. I don't like snakes. <laughs> so just scratch off any nation. As a matter of fact, send me to Ireland. That's where I'll go. I'll go to Ireland. <laughs> you know, because Patrick got rid of the snakes. So send me there. Or, or send, me, send me to a first world country. Don't send me to a developing nation. I don't like smells. And I don't like bodily fluids. Okay? So, you know, I, I, I really struggle with poverty. So don't... And, and, and I realize just how hard my heart is. And how much I, I want to be comfortable. I want to, I want to pursue the Great Commission but in a way that's comfortable to me. And just lay my heart open and say, God, I'm just so hard. Would you soften me? Would you... Would you do a work of grace in me? That grace isn't just merely God's message of unconditional love. It's also his message of transforming power. So God, would you apply the benefits of the blood of Christ to my heart in a new way so that I would become a man by your grace, being restored to the image of Christ day by day, and that I would be a man who, like Paul would say, I've made it my, my aim to work toward Christ being preached where he's never been preached. So pray through Scripture and 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 get in touch with God's missionary heart. Uh, another tool that's very helpful for anybody in the ministry, actually helpful for anybody, is Operation World. It's a book that has uh, all the nations of the earth. It has uh, It's updated uh, every five years or so. They have all the statistics, how large it is, the breakdown of the various religious constituencies in the nation, um, how many missionaries are there, uh, you know, uh, just, just facts about a nation. And, uh, and you can begin to pray for the nations. As you pray for the nations, uh, you're going to gain more of a burden for the nations. The other thing I've gotten uh, regular at doing is I, I read the Wall Street Journal every morning, or try to. And I, what I read basically is the, 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 the one little bar that has the little snippets of everything that's going on in the world. And then if you want to, you can click on it and hit read to see, see the whole article. But I, when I read that, I'm thinking, I'm thinking from a world vision perspective. God, what are you doing in the world? Let's see. This morning, um, the Iran nuclear deal was one of the headlines. Okay, Lord, what are you doing? What's going on? Uh, and God, let me pause to pray for Iran and Iraq, where um, there are Christians, people, people that we will spend eternity with, they're going to die today. Uh, for no other reason <coughs> than they believe what you and I believe. And, and, and having a passion for the persecuted church. Um, and, and again, recognizing what's at stake and what we believe, you know, we're not, we're not trying to build some organization so that we can feel successful. And if you try really hard, you can be a success in America as a pastor. That's not what we're doing. We're, we're trying to be part of an, an organism that does involve organization. That is a agency through which the world's being reached. And, and you shouldn't, um, forget I and mean, find ways if you need to write notes on three by five cards and put it on your mirror in your car, whatever, but find ways to become more aware of what God is doing in the world. Listen, one of the one of the first principles of walking with God is that God is at work around us all the time. We need to wake up and that be one of our first thoughts. God is at work around us all the time. God's at work in our world all the time. You know, we have people in our church. I was talking to Randy about this earlier. They are freaked out about what's happening in America. I mean, freaked out. I had one person say, we're moving to Canada. <laughs> I said, you are kidding me, I hope. It's like, yeah, isn't it amazing? I'm saying to them, you know, just imagine what God's doing right now. I mean, there's sweat on his brow. He's probably wringing his hands. He's got... He's got Armpit stains. I mean, God is really freaking out right now. I think we really ought to head to the hills. We ought to buy one of those bunkers and buy all kinds of water and get all kinds of canned food and get all those, you know, things that NASA uses send to the to the space station. I said, Are you kidding me? I said, God's in control. He's sovereign. He's ruling over the nations by his power and providence. And instead of panicking, where do Christians need to say, Hey, God's at work here? For instance, one of my trips uh, a few years ago was to Japan right after the tsunami. If you know anything about it, but there was an earthquake off the north of Japan. There's a city uh, probably 
bigger and nicer than, than Birmingham. Um, it, is, it is almost like, um, because Birmingham is so spread out, we don't have much of a downtown. Okay, this, this was an entire downtown of all the people. So there's a million people in a, in a downtown area. So it, it almost looks like Manhattan. It, it's no bigger than Birmingham, but it, but it feels like Manhattan. And uh, it's the most conservative religiously uh, city in, in Japan. The city is called Sendai. And uh, it's conservative in that it's most closed to the gospel. By the way, do you realize that Japan is, it was the least evangelized. It is now the second least evangelized nation in the world. Okay. The most, in some ways, technologically advanced. First world. Uh, large economy. Very productive. Highly efficient. Safe. Oh my goodness. You can't go to a safer place than, than Japan. You can go anywhere, women, by yourselves, any time of night or day, and most likely you're going to be safe. Um, yet, I think it's three one-hundredths of one percent of the people of Japan know Jesus. So this tsunami hits. Christians in Japan start taking trucks of aid up to Sendai, and a little bit further north, of a region called Ishinomaki. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> people start noticing, who are these people? What are they doing? And, and you need to realize, they're coming from Tokyo. To go from Tokyo to Sendai and Ishinomaki, you had to go by the Fukushima nuclear plant. Okay, The Fukushima nuclear plant, by the way, is still a mess. They're still very, very concerned about the Fukushima nuclear plant. At that time, they were very concerned because the, the, the tsunami had wrecked uh, a lot of it and it was leaking radiation and they thought it could be the worst nuclear disaster, I mean, to make Chernobyl look like tiddlywinks, okay? And so you had to go by Fukushima to get to Sendai. And so the Japanese people were seeing this and uh, they found out that these were Christians. Well, there is a new openness now uh, in Ishinomaki and Sendai that never would have been there uh, had not the tsunami hit. So when you're listening to the news or you're reading the journal or the times or whatever it is that you read, read it prayerfully. Read it expecting God's at work. Um, and, and then turn that into an opportunity um, to grow in missions yourself. Uh, I have a, a, a huge map, um, probably oh, this big, uh, in my office of the world. Uh, I have it positioned so that I can't lift up my eyes off my computer screen without seeing it. Why? Just another reminder. You know, Anything you can do to get the world on your heart, anything you can do, reading the paper. Listen, I, I'm a U2 freak. Okay? I listen to U2. I'm thinking, Irish band. Not American. Vision for the world. Where the streets have no name. All the nations of the world. I'm thinking, even when I'm listening to you too, I'm thinking world vision. Okay? How do you get there overnight? You've you got to start small. Listen, one of the greatest principles you can take home here, small things done slowly over a long period of time changes the world. Okay? Small things done slowly, faithfully, over a long period of time, changes the world. I, I get fearful sometimes that as Americans, and, and maybe even particularly the millennial generation, you're looking for impact in something that's really big, really huge, and really loud. By the way, that's probably why a lot of pastors don't stay in the same place. They're just looking for greener grass, bigger congregation small things done slowly over a long period of time changes the world it would also change you and so begin to just implement small applications of what I'm talking about if you just do I'm just give you all kinds of ideas take one take two it'll be different than what you're doing now maybe and uh, God will work in your heart. So I have that map. Uh, when, I, when, I, when I read in the journal, 
I read of a country, it's like, I'm not sure exactly where that is. I go up and it's a big enough map that it's got basically everything on it. And I'll search for it until I find it. Or I'll read in the New Testament, you know, Lystra. Where the heck's Lystra? You know, or just wherever in Scripture, or in the Old Testament too. And I do, I'll do searches on where the ancient city of such and such is. And I'll find, oh, it's near modern whatever. And I'll go up and I'll look at it. And it'll make, cause me to pray for the people there. Uh, give. I don't know if you're giving toward missions specifically, but give. Support global missions. Jesus wasn't kidding when he said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You give to missions, it will then cause your heart to go there. You'll be more mindful of praying. You'll be more mindful. Um, and then, like I said, personally go. Uh, I, I try to go on, on at least one global trip every single year, sometimes two. Uh, so last year, actually 2015 will be, or 2014 was huge. I went to Uganda. Our daughter was with the International Justice Mission in Kampala um, for 18 months. So, And we've also sent two families long-term, uh, three families actually, long-term to Uganda. So we went to Uganda, a place I said I'd never go, right? I said I'd never go to Africa because there's snakes there. <laughs> uh, you, you all think I'm joking. I really, I really do hate snakes. Uh, my, my wife loves the outdoors, and I like the outdoors too. But when my wife looks over Oak Mountain, she's thinking, oh, what peace, you know, what beauty. Let's go for a hike. I'm thinking snakes. <laughs> I mean, I can't even enjoy going on a hike at Oak Mountain because I know I'm going to come across a rattlesnake or something. And, and so, okay, so the, so the night I land in India, okay, with the, the same trip went from Uganda to India. So I, I land, in, I land in, uh, in India, and I find out I'm staying in a flat in an apartment where they just had a cobra because some woman who I guess she's Hindu um, is worshiping the cobra, and so she thought she needed to feed it to keep uh, the good spirit around, I guess. And so now the cobra is like enjoying being around the place where I'm staying. And I'm sleeping with one eye open, okay? So, and yet, the, the way God works in us when we, when we open ourselves up and go to places. So, the, so in 2014, I went to Uganda, I went to Japan, I went to uh, India. That, that's an unusual year. But try to go somewhere every year and... and you know, there, there's, a, there's a thousand items clamoring for church budget monies. Don't skimp on that one. Give up your book allowance. Some of you say, wow, that'd be nice if I had a book allowance. Okay. <laughs> give, give up something that you think is good uh, to make sure you keep the great. Um, and uh, you do whatever it takes and, and you convince your board, your elders, your deacons, whatever it is that you believe in in your polity, you convince them that uh, you've got to go. And you, you say, look, you send me three years in a row. And if, and if my preaching and leadership is not different in some way as a result of me going, well, then we'll take it off the table. Just give me three years. And uh, trust me, it'll be in there forever. So uh, go, give. And then uh, I would say, too, read. Um, read good missiology. I don't know if you ever heard of uh, Leslie Newbigin, but uh, I, I think uh, he is um, a great writer. Uh, missionary biographies for me, uh, The Shadow of the Almighty by Jim Elliott, uh, well, by Elizabeth and me, about Jim Elliott. God used that as a brand new Christian to change my life. Just to hear a man whose heart beat uh, for the world. Um, read mission or biographies. John Piper has written one called Filling Up the Afflictions of Christ. It's about Tyndale and Adam Adoniram Judson and, and John Patton. Uh, read books like that. Um, and then uh, my, my final suggestion on, on, that, on this particular area of how to grow personally is seek out a missions mentor. Okay, you may be in a small church. You, you may be a bi bivocational pastor. That's okay. Go to a church that has a missions pastor. Go to a large church. Say, hey, I want to be around somebody who is thinking missions all the time. And maybe once a month, could I just take you to lunch? 
and would you just download missions to me? Tell me what's going on. Tell me what you're learning. Tell me what you're doing. Tell me what your church is doing. How, how are things working as far as spreading a missions vision? Uh, it, it'd just be incredible. Or, or if, uh, if you just know of a pastor who's got a missions vision, you know, seek to spend time with them. There are also all kinds of consultants you could use. There's all kinds of stuff on the web. Look, it's the web for crying out loud. Okay? There's, there's, I'm, I'm in the midst of a series at Oak Mountain called Life in the Fast Lane. And one of the points I made on, on Sunday was that uh, we are in the midst of the information age. Flat news flash there, right? Uh, but, but knowledge is doubling now every 12 months. The knowledge of the world, the knowledge base of all humanity is doubling every 12 months. It, was, it took every 100 years until 1900. Every 25 years after World War II. And it's estimated that soon it will be every 12 hours. So, that's a whole other sermon. Use the web. Do searches. And, and find ways to grow your missions vision. And tr- find ideas to, uh, to go ahead and increase the missions vision of the church. Okay, just have a, a, a couple minutes left. Um, Instituting a, a, a missions vision for the congregation. Well, again, first of all, pastor, leader, you got to be a champion. Okay, then do this. Form a committee. Again, get as many people involved in this as you can. You're going to have to spread the vision. You're going to try to influence as many people as you can. And then seek to identify a few strategic areas. Don't, don't go for the world. Just go for a part of the world that God is impressing upon your heart. Uh, It may be that there are strategic reasons. Um, Like, for instance, uh, when it comes to Oak Mountain, we've made Japan a strategic area. Why? Because everybody else is pulling out. It's it's ridiculously expensive to put missionaries in Japan. And guess what? The American church has decided. Japan, you're just not functionally efficient enough. We don't have enough good newsletter articles for you, Japan. You're way too expensive per missionary, per convert for us to support you. So we're getting out of there. We're going to places where God's really at work. Do we have that option? Do we have that option to say, well, just because uh, Japan's expensive and just because there's so few Christians there, let's go to the place where we have the most bang for our buck? I mean, that's what American evangelicalism has come to. So we've decided Japan. If no one else will go there. We will. Um, we also have our missions pastor, this is no small detail either, spent 10 years in Japan as a missionary. So he's the one who, guess what? He's the one who's filling us with all this information that is accurate and true. So you got to look at God's providence in your church. Who's God brought? What do you know about the world? Who's got passion and vision for what? And then, and then lay out your church's strategic vision for missions. It's critical you do this. You've got to make a plan. Uh, we, we, have, we have a philosophy of missions down to what kind of missions, not just where. We're committed to, to holistic church planting. It, it, look, I was converted through Campus Crusade. But if you're with crew, it's not very likely Oak Mountain's going to support you. It's not because we're not committed to you. We're thankful for you. But we are convinced that our mission philosophy is going to focus on church planting. We believe church planting has, uh, again, small things, done faithfully, slowly, over a long period of time, changes the world. We believe the local church will be here and will be thriving until the day Christ comes back. And so we're committed to local church planting. But holistic church planting that brings into consideration mercy and justice like what happened in Japan. I'm not saying that's the only way. and I'm not saying that's what you need to do. But at Oak Mountain, we know who we are. We know where we're going and we know who we are. We know who we're going to support. Because guess what? You're going to get requests from thousands of people. And you got to know, God, who am I supposed to say yes to and who am I supposed to say no to? And you have to have a ministry missional philosophy. It's going to help you. Same thing's true in your personal life, by the way. You can't say yes to everything. So on what basis do you say no? The church has to do that. Have an intense focus. Again, just our view at Oak Mountain. We're going to support fewer missionaries deeper. Why? 
Because one of the core values of Oak Mountain is that we're going to be relationally driven. If we're going to be relationally driven, that also has to find itself flowing into our, our world missions vision. So to be relationally um, driven means that we're going to support fewer missionaries, a lot more money, so that we build relationship, so that we can say, look, we're flying you to our world missions conference this year. And by the way, we are flying you. you you're going to come. Now, we don't say it meanly like that. But, but clearly, look, hey, we're your larger supporter by a factor of 10. So we need you to be with us because our people who love you want to spend time around you. And we want to pour into you. And we want to build into you. And we want to send you back flying high so that you're more energized to do what God's called you to do. So we support many fewer missionaries than a lot of churches our size because we're going to go deep with a few. You have to decide what you're going to do about that. I think that's a good uh, way to go. I would also uh, encourage you to have unique budgeting. Okay, Unique budgeting. We have faith promise uh, at Oak Mountain, but it's some kind of giving that actually raises missions to a whole new level. Uh, so specific budgeting. Um, and, then, and then be creative. We have a missions kiosk where we have videos of missionaries. In your preaching, use sermon illustrations that point people to the world. Um, Skype in missionaries uh, during the service. And then listen, when you're recruiting leaders, don't just look at their character, oh, that's critical. Don't just look at their knowledge, oh, that's critical. You got a whole host of people that fit that bill. Do they buy into the vision of missions? Why, why would you have elders and deacons who don't buy into missions? Why would you do that? So at Oak Mountain, it's, it's one of the qualifications. Okay, Not just you got to be reformed in your theology. Not just you need to know your Bible. Not just you're Presbyterian in your polity. But do you have a heart for world missions? And do you have a heart for the gospel? 